Well, we are looking this morning at the theme of hope. It is our first Sunday in Advent. And uh, just a, a little background on Advent. I won't go into it a, a whole lot, but just to say a little bit. Uh, Advent is the four weeks leading up to Christmas. And uh, several hundred years ago, the church started celebrating this time um, as a time to remember, as a time to, um, to ponder or remember the first coming of Christ is a part of it, just taking time to remember. Um, I, I don't know about you, but um, life gets busy. And it just seems like it doesn't want to slow down. And it's terrible, but we've kind of made this time of year the busiest time of year for a lot of people. We feel like this is the time of year where we have to have all of our family gatherings. It's this time of year where we have to have all of our work parties. It's this time of year that, that we have to do all of this stuff. Oh, and you've got to bring gifts everywhere you go. So you've got to go and shop. And, and you've got to buy these things for everybody everywhere you go. It kind of defeats the purpose of slowing down and remembering, doesn't it? Because you're really not worrying about remembering Christ. You're really worrying about remembering the parties that you're supposed to go to or remembering the gifts that you're supposed to get or did you remember to hide the receipt so the kids don't find it from this thing that you bought. But really the purpose of Advent is to take four weeks and remember. To remember the first coming of Christ. To remember that, that He came in very humble means to a, a teenage girl. To remember that He came to save the people from their sins. It's a time to remember that first coming of Christ. But it's also time to anticipate that He is coming again. And there's an awful lot of arguments about what that's going to look like, and I'm not going to go into it. All I'm going to say is He's coming again. And we will give account for what we have done, the way that we have lived life. But all things that are out of order now will be put right. We take time to remember, but we also take time to anticipate His second coming. Most churches celebrate four specific messages in the time of Advent. And the first Sunday is the Sunday of hope. It's a time when we, we look forward, even though things are messy now, because we know that something better is coming. The second Sunday is the Sunday of love, and we remember the love of Christ as He came. The third Sunday is the Sunday of joy, and in the Advent wreath, we light a candle for each week, and joy is the pink candle or the rose-colored candle, and the reason for it is because we tend to just let our joy blend in with everything else, and the people who came up with this wreath concept hundreds of years ago said, we need one candle that's different to remind us to smile, because too often in the Christmas season, even though it's the time of joy, and we sing all these joyous songs, Behind the scenes, we're angry because we're not getting stuff done, or we didn't get this that we wanted, or we didn't get that finished. So the third Sunday is the Sunday of joy. And the fourth Sunday is the Sunday of peace. It's a time for us to remember, and it's a time for us to anticipate. Now this week in our reading, in our scripture readings, it's been a time of transition. We started the, the week wrapping up the book of Acts, and I think it was Thursday that we wrapped up the book of Acts, um, and then on Friday we started our Advent reading. So this month of December we're just going to be reading mostly short snippets that, that point to the coming Christ. So I decided this morning to tie them together. So we're going to wrap up Acts, and we're going to look at our Advent readings today. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn with me to Acts chapter 27, or if you open the church app, it should open up to this passage. 
In Acts chapter 27, we see that, uh, that Paul is on his way to Rome. He's a prisoner on his way to Rome because of his uh, desire to preach the gospel. And as he's making his way to Rome, it's the wrong time of year to be sailing, but they're making their way to Rome anyway. And it says in verse 13, when a light be wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it. So they pulled up anchor and sailed close to the shore of Crete. But the weather changed abruptly, and a wind of typhoon strength called a northeaster burst across the island and blew us out to sea. The sailors couldn't turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and let it run before the gale. We sailed along the sheltered side of a small island named Caudia, where with great difficulty we hoisted aboard the lifeboat being towed behind us. The sailors then bound ropes around the hull of the ship to strengthen it, and they were afraid of being driven across the sandbars of Sirtis off the African coast. So they lowered the sea anchor to slow the ship and were driven before the wind. The next day, as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began throwing the cargo overboard. The following day, they even took some of the ship's gear and threw it overboard. And the terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars, until at last, all hope was gone. Until at last, all hope was gone. It's a rough place to be when all hope is gone. Now this trip that, that they were on started out innocently enough. They were making their way to Rome, and so they were on an island, the island of Crete, and they were in a place called Fair Havens. Now when you think of Fair Havens, that name kind of indicates that'd be a good place to spend the winter. It's fair, and it's a haven. They misnamed this place. The truth is that Fair Havens was not a very good place to spend the winter. And if you were traveling across the Mediterranean Sea in a, in a ship, you did not try to make it all the way to your destination. You would reach a certain point and you would wait because the storms were intense. Fair Haven was not the best port to spend winter in. It was, it was not shielded very well. In other words, the, the, your, your ship would be exposed to the constant waves of the sea from the storms that would roll in. And quite honestly, the town of Fair Havens was not much of a town. Now, I grew up in a, in a very small place. The name of it was Millport. And if you drove through it, you probably wouldn't know that you had just driven through it. Because really, there's a sign that says Millport and a road that crosses the highway and you keep going and you didn't know you just ran past or drove through a town. Now, if you were to turn this way and go down the hill, then you would come to, at the time I was growing up, Millport Grocery. It was our grocery store, our gas station, our movie rental place, our deli. And it, it was just that one place that sold everything. If you were to turn this way in Millport, you would go to First House up on a hill would be somebody that you didn't mess with. He was a retired cop from Chicago and would shoot at anybody that came close. <laughs> You'd go down here is the taxidermist, and then here was my house, and then here was the gun shop and the, the uh, hunting store, and that's Millport. There's not much to do. If you were stuck in Millport, um, you'd probably be pretty bored. If you were, in the case of these so these sailors, there were 200 and some people on board this ship, stuck in Fair Havens, you would feel an awful lot like you were in Millport. There's nothing to do. And if you're going to be there for a couple of months, you want to be in a place where there's at least places to eat and, and entertainment, something to do across this winter. But Fair Havens, even though the name says something different, was not an ideal place to spend the winter. But just a few miles away, 30 or 40 miles down the coast, was a place called Phoenix. Now Phoenix was a place that you would want to spend the winter. It, it was, it was a, a, a vibrant city that had lots of entertainment, lots of things to keep the sailors busy. There were plenty of, plenty of food there. It was, it was a great place to spend the winter and a much better protection for the ships in the harbor. The problem was that sailing in the Mediterranean Sea was seasonal. 
Now I know that today is the first day of, or yesterday was the first day of deer season, and many of you are frustrated that you're here, and many of us are not here because they're out there. We understand seasonal, but there's a difference because it doesn't matter what yesterday's temperature would have been, whether it was in the 60s or whether it would have been in the 20s, there would have been people out there because that's the season that you go out there. In the Mediterranean Sea, seasonal means there's this period of time when you can sail. It is safe to, fa to sail between March, sometimes April, and September, sometimes October. But in between the months of October and March, if you tried to sail, I'm sure they had a word for you in the Greek language. I don't know what it is in, Gre in Greek, but in English it's stupid. You don't do that. It is stupid to try to cross the Mediterranean Sea in this time period. You, good things don't happen if you try to cross in this time period. After November, it was just absolutely stupid to try to, to sail. And the date here, we don't know exactly, but we know it was after October 5th. Paul is referenced, or Luke is referenced, that it was after the Day of Atonement, which in that year was October 5th. So we know it's October, possibly getting close to November, into that time period where it's just stupid to try to sail. The winds, the day that they started out, were soft. The trip was only about 30 to 40 miles down the coast. They would be staying close to the coast most of the time, and there was better harbor ahead. It made sense to everybody except for Paul. Let's just, let's go. We can make it. It's, it's, a, it's just, just a quick trip. Shouldn't take less than, a, less than a day. But Paul did not want to go on. Now, Paul had been on at least 11 sea journeys up to this point. So he'd been on a ship across the Mediterranean Sea at least 11 times. And according to 2 Corinthians, we know that he had been shipwrecked at least three times out of the 11. What? That's not very good odds. Um, being shipwrecked, and Paul says one time he even spent a night and a day floating in the sea waiting to be rescued. Um, he's a little bit weary or leery of, of trying to make this journey. He knows that it sounds good. He knows that it's a soft wind, but he's like, guys, we don't want to go today. Honestly, Paul was most likely the most experienced traveler on board the ship. Probably more experienced than the captains were, because if the captains were experienced, then they would know it's stupid to travel at this time of year. In fact, I didn't read it all because it would take too, too long, but, but leading up to this, Luke told us how difficult it was. They couldn't get this way because the winds weren't going the right direction, and it was slow going when they tried to, to make it this way. Paul was probably the most experienced traveler on board the ship, but the ship was a grain ship, and it was trying to make it to Rome because there was a bonus. If you were the last grain ship to make it into Rome before the winter, and they really wanted to have that extra grain before winter, and it would be a long time before they could get any more grain, there's a little bit of a bonus. The smart, the smart uh, sea captains knew that that bonus wasn't worth it. But young and inexperienced, greedy sea captains would say, you know what, I'm going to try for that bonus. So Paul was probably the most experienced on board. And he knew that even though this was a very short journey, it would be very risky. And the storm hit. The Greek says it had violent winds. And we in our English translations have tried to translate that into either typhoon or hurricane force winds. And the storm lasted over two weeks. Now we've gone through periods where the sun doesn't shine for a week or two. And that's pretty horrific. But imagine being in the middle of a stormy sea when you don't see the sun. The sailors, as soon as that wind hit, they couldn't control the ship. They had to just let it run in front of the gale. There's nothing they could do to control the ship. They hoisted the lifeboat, which they typically would allow to, to float behind to save room on the ship. They bound ropes around the wooden hull of the ship. They lowered their anchor to try to slow themselves down. They threw their cargo overboard. 
They threw some of the ship's gear overboard, and just in case you're wondering what that might be, most scholars think that that's probably the sails, the main sails of the ship, because that's a lot of weight, and those poles were rolling back and forth across the deck, causing them to get closer and closer to the water, and so they just threw it overboard. They said, we're safer. The reason that the captain was willing to try to make it to Rome at this time of year is because he wanted that bonus. Now he just lost everything. He had to throw his cargo overboard. And this storm was intense. Have any of you ever been in the middle of a sea or in the middle of an ocean in the middle of a storm? Jackie has? Okay. I never have. And I've, I've, as I've read this passage, I've wondered what would it have been like? Now, I preached this passage actually... Some of you may remember, this was my first message when I interviewed here. I preached from this passage of Scripture. Um, I had just finished preaching it in McCook uh, not too long before then, and so I adjusted it a little bit before I preached it here. And I, came, I searched on YouTube and found a video of a, a ship at sea, and I don't think I was able to show it to you that night. I didn't even know if you had a projector when I came to the interview. Um, the storm that this ship is, is in... It just shows from the outside, and I want us just to look at and listen to the wind in this, in this video of this ship in hurricane strength winds. That look like fun? This is what hurricane strength winds do to the sea. It's intense. Um, so I found this video seven, eight years ago. And so I, I pulled that one back up. But I started wondering this week, what would it have been like inside the boat? Because it's one thing to look at from the outside and to get nauseated. But I really want us to, to be in the holiday spirit. So what would it be like inside the ship? So here's a couple of clips from inside the ship. It's not the same ship, but a similar ship. Look at the horizon. So watch the horizon through the windows. Now, when I was researching this, they, they actually said that there were some good days, and I think it actually will say it on this video. There were some good days in the middle of this storm, and so here's what it looked like on the good days. Does that look like fun yet? Um, th these videos were shot, the ones from inside the ship were shot about 2010 to 2011, December of 2010 to January of 2011. There was a two-week storm out on the outside, outskirts of Scotland where this ship was shot these videos. And they just said, here's what it was like. We've been in the middle of this hurricane strength and 
storm for two weeks. And here's a, here's a, a look at what it was like. It's actually a 23-minute video that I cut down. Um, so that's the good days, but this has all been inside the cabin. And one of the challenges is that, um, you know, this is a ship that has stuff on the deck, and that deck, the stuff on the deck has to make, you have to make sure that it's tightened down and it might vibrate loose in all of this. And so they had to periodically go out and check to make sure that things were tied down on the deck. So here's what it looked like from the deck. on a good day. like fun yet? Bill's ready to go. Want to go on a cruise? It's that time of year. <laughs> so here's, here's what it looked like during the day. But one of the challenges is it was 14 days and 14 nights. The waves keep coming at, at night. And they say at night you can't see the waves coming. So you have no idea what you're waiting for. I did have to, uh, to mute the sound in a portion of this because some expletives came out. So I did mute those. Um, but this is an interesting view as well. At night, you can just see the white caps right in front of you. That's what the expletives did. So when Paul said all hope was gone, or Luke said all hope was gone, you're kind of getting a sense for what, why they would say that. But let's look at what takes place in the inner core of the ship where the people are actually at. Um, I think that's my next video. Yeah, in the kitchen. Getting a cup of coffee. Going to the break room with a cup of coffee. Can you imagine 14 days at sea? And that's, interestingly, how long this ship was at sea. But there's a couple of differences. Number one, in, in this ship, they had radar. They had navigation. They knew exactly where they were at. This is what we think that the ship that Paul was on looked like. Can you imagine? You have the sails. Well, you did. You threw those overboard. You have this tower. There's no cabin at the top with windshield wipers. So when those waves hit, you could get knocked off of that very easily. And then you had the inner core of the ship. 14 days. 
Did I mention that this ship was made out of wood? Can you imagine, I mean, the ship that, that, that we watched the videos from, and I intentionally left the sound on on those, because I wanted you to hear the creaking of the metal. But it was metal. It's steel. It's designed for this type of storm, or they wouldn't have sent it out in that. Now, nobody wants to do it, but they sent them out in the storm knowing that this ship was designed so that it could withstand it. But in Paul's case, it's a wooden ship. The first thing that they did was they tried to get the lifeboat up because the lifeboat was taking on water and it was pulling down the rear of the, of the ship. But they certainly didn't want to leave the lifeboat behind. They needed that. They thought they might need that. And so the second thing that they did was they took wood, or they took rope, and lowered it and tried to tie it around the hull of the ship to give a little bit of extra strength so that the wood would not fall apart as it's going up and down, crashing on the waves. This is a pretty intense storm. And I think it's one of those times where we read through this in Scripture and we think, oh yeah, that's a storm, and you keep reading, but you miss the reality, this was not just a storm. It's very hopeless if you are on board. As Luke told us, all hope was gone. Their ship was not built for this storm. They had no clue where they were. Their chances of survival were slim. Do you know how they could tell where they were at in the Mediterranean Sea in Paul's day? They didn't have a compass. They didn't have a sextant. They didn't have any instruments. They didn't have radar. They looked at the stars. And the experienced sailors in the Mediterranean knew that at this time of year, that star tells me I'm here. They did not see the sun or the stars for 14 days. They had no clue where they were at. They were afraid of running on sandbars because on one side of the Mediterranean Sea off an African coast, there are just tons of sandbars that can derail your ship or you can get stuck on the sandbar and you're still too far from the coast to swim in. They had no clue where they were at. All they could think about is all of the places they could be coming up against that could destroy their ship. <coughs> but they don't know. Even if the storm ended, their cargo was gone. They had no clue where they were at. Their food supplies were low. And the ship's gear was gone. The sails were gone. How are we going to get somewhere? Because even if the storm ends, we're not right along the coast anymore. You're probably going to be out in the middle of the sea. You could be in the Atlantic Ocean for all they knew. They had no clue where they were at. All hope was gone. But Paul brought to the people a message of hope. And if you have your Bibles and you want to continue reading the story, chapter 27, verse 21. No one had eaten for a long time. I think that's humorous. Can you imagine eating in that? Now, I, I know 14 days you've got to eat something. But can you imagine eating? <laughs> I don't think they had restrooms on board for you to, uh, to throw up in either. So finally, Paul called the crew together. And said, men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. Well, duh, we already know that one. You would have avoided all this damage and loss. But take courage, for none of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for surely you will stand trial before Caesar. And what's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God, and it will be just as he said. But we will be shipwrecked on an island. When we think about what Paul said, when he said, take courage, God has, in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. 
there's a glimmer of hope. Just a glimmer. But you know what? Paul was the only one on board that knew that they should not have gone on the journey that they were on. He's the one who told them in Crete, don't do it. Don't go there. And now when Paul comes forward and says, the God whom I serve sent an angel to stand beside me last night. And he said that we were all going to survive. There's a glimmer of hope. I'm sure that there also is a sense of, are you sure it wasn't just hallucinations? Because you haven't eaten and you were all going like this. But, but there's a glimmer of hope. skip through these scriptures. I won't read the whole story. Hope returned. They were hopeless, but God had promised their safety and they eventually would all be saved. And I won't go into finishing that story. But I want us to look at hope today. Because Luke and Paul in this situation were understandably hopeless. But God came through. This is the message of the gospel. This is why this church exists. This is why churches all across the, the Quad Cities, all across the world exist. Not just so that you can come in and feel good about yourself, but because the message of the gospel is a message of hope. It says that we're not stuck in the messy world that we live in with no hope whatsoever. It isn't just Luke and Paul's story. Because hope is available to all of us. Now, not all of us have been on a ship in the middle of a sea, in the middle of a storm. But we've all been in storms in our lives. And we've all faced these situations where we feel hopeless. And yet it's in those situations where we feel hopeless that God brings the message of hope. No matter how intense our storm may seem, is there. Hope is the first message of Advent. And so with this in mind, we remember the hope that Christ brought that very first Christmas. We'll look more at this story, and most of us know this story pretty well. The, the message of the Messiah first came to an old man too old to have kids, and the message was that you're going to have a kid. And his response was, uh, you're crazy. You know how old my wife is? And thankfully, the angel shut his mouth from that time forward, and he could not speak until after the baby was born. That was a gift to Elizabeth, I know it. <laughs> Sometimes I wish the Lord would have given me that gift when I... Anyway. But that message of hope, and we read in Luke's gospel, that old man's response once his child had been born and once he could speak again, hope is coming. We're not stuck in the mess that we've been stuck in. There's hope. There's a new day coming. And then when the angel appeared to Mary, and Mary, this young, probably 13 to 14 year old girl, was told that she was going to have a child and it was going to be the Messiah. And then we read in Luke's gospel her response to that. And the theme of that is there is hope. That even though everything has seemed hopeless, there is hope. The message of hope that Christ brought that first Christmas is something that we need to remember. But we also look forward to the reality that there is hope in Christ's second coming. Because I don't know about you, but I'm sick of hearing the news stories. I'm sick of hearing what's taking place all across our world. I'm sick of, of the, the reports of, of people living in sinful ways and doing things to harm other people. I'm sick of idiots having access to nuclear weapons. I'm sick of, of, of the reality of the world that we're in. And so I look forward with hope to the second return of Christ. I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen. But I know that God is a God of hope. And we look forward with hope to whatever that's going to look like. 
But the message of hope is not just a message for us to sit in a holy huddle and say, aren't we glad we can be hopeful? It's a message that we're to share. Paul shared that hope with the entire ship. If he hadn't shared that message of hope with the entire ship, things would have gone very differently. And we're to share hope with those around us. Hope is not just uh, ours. And hope, there's nothing that I can do to drum up hope. Hope is a gift from God. I want us to just for a moment think about, and maybe for the rest of this week think about, very seldom do we see and understand the pain that those around us are going through. We live in a world that has taught us to share the good stuff and not really share the bad stuff. Or when we share the bad stuff, we're usually sharing it in such an angry way that people don't see the pain causing it. This week on Facebook, a couple of friends of Janelle and I from Kansas City who had gone through a divorce a year ago, um, he decided to share his side of the story on Facebook this week. It's never a good idea to do that, just in case you're wondering. And for some reason, he sent me a message early this week and just said, hey, man, I just wrote out my, this story. What, what do you think? And I read it, and I felt so bad because it's very clear from reading that story that he had not thought at all about the fact that he was friends on Facebook with people who were her friends and his friends. And I sent back a response, just very generic, and just said, hey, man, I know this has been a tough spot for you. But I'm praying for all of you and for your kids in this time. And then the next day, she heard about it. And her response, she, she handled it very gracefully. But just watching that battle go back and forth, and he wanted to post, I think he had like 10 posts that, that detailed this experience. Finally, last night, his mother had called him and said, did you not think that this would be hurtful to her? And he said, no, I didn't think about it. I was just telling my side of the story. So finally, he apologized last night. But as I watched this, just in horror, uh, because it's somebody that I knew fairly well and have stayed in touch with, you know what? I didn't know what his pain was. I was frustrated with him because I could tell that he was being pretty selfish. I could tell she was being very selfish as we all have that tendency to do. But I didn't know his story. He'd shared a little bit with me over, actually we met in Wapalo for breakfast one day. And he shared a little bit of it with me. But truthfully, we don't know people's stories. Just like when we read this story in the book of Acts and we read there was a storm of northeaster, they called it the northeaster, or we call it hurricane strength winds. There's a storm, but until you watch it, you really don't even get a sense for what that storm was. And I'm guessing that if you spent 14 days in the belly of a ship, you'd have a whole lot more empathy for what Paul and Luke were experiencing. We don't typically see the pain of those around us. But I can tell you there's a whole lot of people who need hope. Too frequently we get caught up in our own lives, especially this time of year. And so perhaps we need to be reminded as we look at this story of hope to look around us and to realize that there's more going on than we read in the pages or that we see in the lives of our friends. Maybe there's more there. And maybe we need to be more attentive to those things. And my prayer for us is that the hope of Christ would shine through us this Advent season as our worship team comes. That we would not be so caught up in just going through the, the motions. That we would not just try to get stuff done but that we would allow the hope of Christ to impact us 
that in the areas of our hopelessness we could find the hope that Christ came to offer. But also that we could pay attention to those who are hurting around us. That we could see their pain and be able to shine the hope of Christ into their lives. Now I'll tell you, we don't shine the hope of Christ by telling people how wrong they are. That's not how you shine the hope of Christ. You shine the hope of Christ by loving. And Jesus said that his, his disciples would be known as followers of him, not because they could tell people when they were wrong, but by the way that they loved one another. And my hope for us this Advent season and beyond is that we could experience the hope of Christ but that the hope of Christ could shine through us into the hurting world around us. We sing a lot of songs at Christmas that sometimes we don't stop to think about what they mean. One of those that we sing, and we're going to sing now, is the first Noel. Anybody know what that means? I had to Google it this week. The first Christmas greetings. If the first Sunday of Advent is the Advent of hope, and Advent is, is looking forward to Christ's return, as well as remembering his first coming, maybe our greetings of Christmas this year should be laced with a prayer. It says, let the hope of Christ shine through me. So I may say to you, Merry Christmas, but as I'm saying to you, Merry Christmas, I'm praying, Lord, let the hope of Christ shine through me. May we be conduits of hope in the dark world that we live in. So as we sing the first Noel, as we wish people Merry Christmas, may we be doing it not just to go through the motions, but to truly speak hope. Let's stand together as we close.